Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the world over. The Islamic State's assault on Christians and other religious minorities in the Middle East has been underway for well over three years. Despite the president's hardline rhetoric against Islamic Jihad, Egypt's Coptic Christian community seems to be under continual siege by ISIS. Here with expert analysis of the current situation is the director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute, Nina Shea, joined by Hudson's senior fellow and native Coptic Christian, Sam Tadros. Thank you both for being here. Great to be here. I, I want to start with this bill that Chris Smith, Congressman Chris Smith, moved this week, and it was about Iraq and Syria genocide aid, uh, wanting to make sure that that aid is actually reaching the intended destination. How do you track these funds, given the situation we're dealing with there? Well, you need a lot of oversight, frankly. And, but the truth is that the Christians and the Yazidis who are targeted by genocide, uh, by ISIS, have not received any direct U.S. aid or U.N. aid in three years. Why not? Uh, they, there has been a preference for the other communities, the majority Muslim communities, um, and uh, they are now at the point where their private aid is running dry, there's donor fatigue, and this month they ran out of food aid for the largest community of Iraqi Christians who are survivors of ISIS in, in uh, the Chaldean Archdiocese of Erbil, Kurdistan. We hear about this battle for Mosul. They, the American military claims it's close to capturing Mosul again. You tell me, give me a sense of what life is like for these communities there. I mean, I still read of crucifixions and the indiscriminate uh, yeah, murdering of people. Re relentless uh, suicide bombing. Hmm. It's going to be very tough for any minority to survive in this atmosphere. Ford up or flee is really should be the mantra for any minority community in the Middle East these days. And that we see, you know, Israel's defended, uh, the, the Kurds are defended, they can stay. But those groups that don't have a military of their own, like the Christians, really don't stand a, a chance because their governments don't protect them. It's unbelievable. Um, Sam Tadros, I want to talk for a moment about the Coptic Christians in Egypt, uh, a community I'm very familiar with having spent time there, and of course you are. You're, you're uh, a Copt yourself. Give me a sense of how this persecution has intensified. I mean, we've see, we saw that horrendous attack on that bus going out to the monastery, uh, it, it, you know, in a, in a far flood, down a dirt road, literally. Uh, they knew who they were targeting. They targeted them deliberately. They called cops their favorite prey. Why and what has changed? Well, it seems we've always been special, even when the Islamic State was just a local group in Iraq. If you recall, mm -hmm. back in October 2010, while taking Christian hostages in the main church of Baghdad, they had demands related to the Copts of Egypt, what they claimed were their sisters being kidnapped by the Copts. Copts have always been special for in the world of Islamism. Mm. Perhaps it's the fact that they are over 50% of the Middle East Christian presence. Perhaps it's the fact that many of the Islamist leaders, ideologues, key operatives, have been Egyptian, Sayyid Qutb, mm. Ayman al-Zawahri of al-Qaeda. So the Copts mm. have always been very special, more than even the other Christian communities, in the eyes of what became today the Islamic State. I was shocked to read a piece you wrote not long ago about the number of Copts that have left. 20 percent, you believe, of the population has left in the last 50 years. What is driving that? And tell me the story of that village you related in the Washington Post not long ago. So, so the Copts, uh, there are obviously economic reasons. The country's economy is not doing well. But there is the very fact that you are being discriminated against, that you are being denied opportunities because you're Christian, not just in government appointments, in every aspect of life. If you're a Christian kid who wants to play soccer, for example, and they reject you in a soccer team because they see that little cross tattooed on your hand, right. this identification of your faith out there. Mm -hmm. so, so this has really pushed the Copts outside of Egypt border. And remember, the Copts have, throughout their history, been so tied to the land of Egypt, yeah. the land of the Nile, the land that the Holy Family had visited and blessed with their visit. Well, these so, are the original Egyptians. Let's, yeah, it's, let's admit it's that. the descendants of the pharaohs. The very word Copt means Egyptian. It is derived mm -hmm. from the Greek word for Egypt, yeah. basically, yeah. Egyptus. Mm -hmm. And But for the past 50 years, we've seen this 
countless wave of immigration, of Copts fleeing the country, finding new places in the West. We started with two Coptic churches in 1970 when the late Pope Shenouda became Pope. Today we have 250 churches in the United States alone. Wow. So it's an unprecedented growth in the United States, Canada, Australia. Regarding that village you mentioned, it's a fascinating story. Starts with one, it's a completely Christian village in the middle of Egypt, one of two remaining completely Christian mm. villages. It starts with one inhabitant from the village being accepted in the American Green Card Lottery, mm. coming here in the late 90s. Now there are about 500 of the village population here. Every year, the entire adult population of the village just applies for the U.S. lottery. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about what the Pope said when he was in Egypt. Uh, Nina, we were talking about this earlier. He has called on all of us to decry this violence and to separate these people, at least rhetorically, from their acts from God, which they, of course, the Islamic State tries to conflate the two. Your thoughts on what he's saying and what he should be saying? Yes, I thought the Pope's uh, speech, which was at Al-Azhar, the center of uh, Islamic learning in Egypt, was very strong. He uh, really made the case that they need to have a cultural transformation through education by having an educational system that will lead to inquiry and mm. innovation and wisdom, uh, critical thinking. Uh, this is something that's lacking. So it wasn't just, oh, you need to be more tolerant, that kind of vagueness, although he did mention to the need for tolerance. But it was that you have to be open to other ideas. Mm. And that, you know, is part of the problem, is this, um, th th this total disregard, even hostility towards the religious other, and Christians in particular, because they are the largest minority there. I want to play something for you. This is President Trump uh, during his recent visit to Saudi Arabia, where he spent a lot of the time decrying Islam and rallying the forces of the uh, Arab world, mostly Sunni, to his cause. Watch. Muslim nations must be willing to take on the burden if we are going to defeat terrorism and send its wicked ideology into oblivion. The first task in this joint effort is for your nations to deny all territory to the foot soldiers of evil. Every country in the region has an absolute duty to ensure that terrorists find no sanctuary on their soil. He, of course, went on to demand that uh, all these people through the Middle East and the leaders particularly drive these ISIS forces out of their countries, even expel them from the earth. Your thoughts on how is this playing in the Middle East? I'll start with you, Sam. Well, the problem, of course, is that people in the region have very different definitions of who the terrorists are. Mm. If you talk to the Egyptian government, this includes the Muslim Brotherhood that has been in a ferocious fight with the Egyptian regime for the past three or four years. If you talk to the Qataris, on the other hand, they think the Muslim Brotherhood are the good guys that they continue to support, fund their TV networks and their activities. So that building a coalition of Middle East states is not the easiest thing because they themselves have their strong disagreements. More importantly, this is today well beyond the control of just one government. There was a moment in time when the Saudi government was the clear power behind this actively. Today, the beast has really left the, the, anyone's control and is now very hard for any government to really stop. And is this why President Trump turned to the Saudis? Because now they're feeling the blowback. They're seeing members of their own family and their government targeted. The Wahhabi uh, yeah. ideology that was born in Saudi Arabia and nurtured there is now, as Sam said, out of control, like Pandora's box. Yes, and ISIS was using Saudi textbooks. Saudi Arabia is ground zero for this uh, really uh, harsh, uh, intolerant ideology. And so I think it's still, and the textbooks are still uh, full of it. So uh, filled with this uh, hostility and directions to commit violence against those who are not protected and anti-Semitic, you know, the protocols of the elders of Zion yep. is historical fact that the Jews want to take over the world, that kind of thing, but also against Christians and infidels and unbelievers. So, um, it, you know, it's very important. This is the first time, Raymond, that the U.S. government acknowledged that there is an ideology, an Islamist ideology is what he called it, an extreme Islamist ideology mm -hmm. that's connecting 
all these terror attacks, whether they're in London or Manchester or here or in right. Egypt. Right. Well, identifying the problem and solving it are two different things, though. Mm -hmm. Do you think this advances the ball? Does this help neutralize or at least isolate ISIS to Iran, essentially? Um, I think that it does. I think it's how we've got to identify the problem. It's we're way behind the times. It's now been 16 years since 9/11, mm. and we've wasted that time attacking different uh, tactics and uh, groups here and there. And it's a whack-a-mole game. So we now have to develop a, a, a raft of policies that flow from this uh, this uh, insight that this is an ideology. Sam, before I let you go, how are the Coptic Christians seeing this? Do they see this as a possibility of hope? Or is this more of the same? I mean, I remember being there almost 20 years ago. I had an 18-year-old translator or a 17-year-old translator. And the last day we were together, she had bruises down the side of her face because she'd been beaten on a corner for just what you said. They saw a little cross she had on her, around her, her neck. This, this has been going on for a long time. It has, and it's increasing. The, the number of attacks that the Copts in particular have faced in the last couple of months, last six months, there have been four, four major incidents, both the bombing of the cathedral in Cairo compound, mm -hmm. the bombing of two churches in Palm Sunday, and then this horrific massacre. This unprecedented level of targeting and the Islamic State increasing its pressure in its presence in Egypt as it faces pressure in Mosul. So as the Islamic State, now they're going to lose Mosul. They might lose Raqqa uh, next. Mm. They're also thinking, where do we go next? Where do we go next? And yeah. they look at Egypt, and it's a tempting target. Mm -hmm. It's one of the largest Muslim-majority countries. It's, it's an ideal situation where the sectarian card, the anti-Christian card, plays well with the local population and can be utilized by them, just as they use the anti-Shia card to mobilize the Sunni population mm. in Iraq. Sam Tadros, Nina Shea, you want to add one thing? Well, I'd like to add that the, there are 9 million cops. And so if there is an all-out war to eradicate them like there has been against the uh, Iraqi Christians, mm -hmm. this will destabilize the Middle East for decades to come, and it will harm our interests. We better wake up. Okay. Thank you both for being here. Nina Shea and Sam Tadros' work at Hudson Institute Center for Religious Freedom can be found at Hudson. Org. That is all the time we have until next week. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. You can also sign up for my e-blast. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.